Welcome to Sector Report. I'm David Beetson. This week, can New Zealand really crack the global halal market? Why can't we eliminate the disease that's been the scourge of New Zealand farming? And what do you do when you've improved on nature and it's time to quit? I've put so much into this and been so blessed in watching it fulfilled. Well, Alaskan-born Tony Ryger is the founder of the Southland Wetlands Trust. He spent the best part of the last decade recreating Big Lagoon, the second largest freshwater coastal lagoon in the province. It was down to a one hectare mud hole when he arrived. Today, it's a 50 hectare haven for more than 70 species of bird life. And at 76, Tony is ready to leave. But he has a problem, as our rural correspondent Neil Parker discovered. A crisp dawn breaks over Southland. To me, when I first saw it, I realized this is the place I need to be. Tony Riga and Mandy are on daily patrol, a leisurely lap around Big Lagoon. In all honesty, um, something really miraculous happened to me when I first came here and, and laid eyes on it and walked around on it. If it hadn't been for Tony Riga, there would be no Big Lagoon. I really definitely felt I had had a calling to come here and do this. The former Alaskan schoolteacher has spent most of the last decade restoring Big Lagoon to its former glory. I don't take any credit for what has happened myself. Uh, I, I, I feel like I've simply been a conduit for something that m was meant to be. Big Lagoon was drained in the 1980s by farmers eager to expand grazing lands. When Tony Riga bought the property in 2003, it was just a mud hole. In all probability, shouldn't have been drained in the first place. But then again, if it hadn't been drained, I wouldn't have wound up here. Nowadays, at 32 hectares, Southland's second largest inland wetland is home to more than 70 species of bird and a healthy population of short-finned eels. This is like a year into... Into the project. Into the project, right. yeah. Tony first came to New Zealand in 1974. I always had uh, uh, a desire to come here and see if it was for real. Ever since I was a small boy, one of the first books I can remember reading was uh, on New Zealand. And the fact that it was so exotic and it spoke English was thrilling for me. I, fe I felt like, gee, I could really get on there, you know, I w wouldn't have to learn the native language. In 1978, Tony discovered Southland and fell in love with the place. More significantly, he heard about Big Lagoon. I was looking for a piece of property that I could help at least uh, be restored and maybe be enhanced. And everywhere I looked on the North Island was very expensive and was attached to properties when they did come up for sale in, to much larger areas than I was really capable of of, of getting involved with. But I heard about this property, 123 acres, being an almost ideal site to try to restore because it had been drained for agricultural purposes about 25 years ago. As soon as I saw it, I knew this is the place that I really wanted to try to develop and do something with. When Tony bought Big Lagoon, he intended to restore and enhance it, but he hadn't intended spending too much money. Fat chance of that. And it just worked out. <laughs> I did wind up investing my life savings in it. Tony threw his energies and his money into restoration, which included building a dam and reforestation. We put these pines in eight years ago with the idea of, first of all, uh, having a commercial crop. After all, we are technically a tree farm here. When the land was cleared, it was really scalped, which makes it difficult for native trees to grow back. 
by going in and removing the pine selectively, we've got an ideal environment here for the native trees to come back. The pine plantings shade out the gorse and provide cover for more delicate native trees like totara. Most of our weather comes from the west or from the south, so it's additional protection for the lagoon. Initially, Tony's dream wasn't shared by his neighbours. The dairy farmers on three sides were reluctant to have anything to do with the restoration. Well, I have to say in all fairness that I've discovered in my time on earth that um, the quality of life really so often depends on how well you do get on with your neighbours. Uh, regardless of whether it's New York City or whether it's uh, Taramoa. But Tony's perseverance won their respect, and now there is detente, as Tony puts it, despite their different ideologies. But a year ago, Tony suffered a heart attack and faces the inevitability of having to part with his dream. Already the buyers are circling, but he's waiting for the right one. The frosting on the cake for me is finding somebody that not only is willing to pay the price, but somebody that has uh, the same values and the same passions and the same sense of custodialship that I do. Uh, and that may not happen. Uh, that may not happen for a while. And so I need to hunker down and be patient. And uh, uh, sooner or later, when it's meant to be, it'll happen. I must admit that uh, when I start to get myself feeling kind of down, uh, there isn't a lot of good news lately, uh, and it hasn't been good news for a while. All I have to do is go down to the lagoon, listen to the goose music, listen to the waves lapping on the shore, look at, look at the incredible beauty of it all, and, uh, and be able to appreciate the fact that it's sustainable. It's hard to think about leaving. Uh, I, I, I put so much into this uh, and been so blessed in watching it fulfilled. And now you've got to leave it. That's right. A time has come where uh, for health reasons and for family considerations, I need, to, uh, I need to think about the next chapter. How do you feel about that? Not very good, but it's reality, and uh, I'd like to go on forever uh, finding places to restore and putting back the way the good Lord intended them to be, but uh, you only got only so much time at that, and I have to accept that. To me, it, it's, uh, it's the f fulfillment, in a way, of a lifelong dream, not only to come to New Zealand, but to give something back to New Zealand. Once you know what needs to be done, you just have to throw yourself into it and get it to happen. And uh, sometimes it's, uh, it's demanding, but the rewards, if you reach any level of achievement at all and success, are awful sweet. Neil Parker with Tony Riger. Next, can New Zealand really crack the global halal market? Stay with Sector Report. New Zealand has launched a fresh effort to build trade ties in the Southeast Asia region, with our negotiators starting to work on a 10-nation free trade deal. The region's home to one of the world's largest and fastest growing Muslim populations, and we've been working hard to make inroads into the market there for halal foods. That's foods produced, processed and distributed in accord with Muslim principles. The hard work has seen New Zealand become the first non-Muslim nation to establish industrial slaughter practices that observe halal principles. And last year, our Ministry for Primary Industries achieved another breakthrough as the first agency from a non-Muslim nation to win an award for Best Service Provider at the World Halal Forum. But it hasn't all been plain sailing. Here's the Chairman of New Zealand's Halal Standards Advisory Council, Dr Anwar Ghani. Thank you for joining us. 
There's been a lot of talk, a, a, a lot of uh, preparation, a lot of negotiation, a lot of discussion, but are we actually in New Zealand really growing both the scope and the scale uh, of the halal market that could be available? I think uh, certainly, yes, there's more awareness now than what we had 15, 20 years ago. Uh, looking at the, the numbers in the early 80s, we used to do trade in the, with the halal market with $3 million. And now it's estimated to be about $2.5 billion when we combine the meat as well as the milk products and some of the other derivatives. So it's a substantial market. So you, you can see from 80s to now in 2011, 2012, we are, we are a, it's, it's a significant market. So certainly there's more awareness and um, it's, it's becoming, in, in certain areas, it's becoming a premium market. Are we fairly limited, however, in our, our perspective on just what the market is and what it could be? Uh, yes and, and no as well. I think yes in a sense... <laughs> I love that, that answer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, in a, in a sense that, yeah, we, we're relying on traditional markets which have served us well in the past, uh, but no in the sense that, yes, the industry now is much more aware of um, that w w the size of the market. For example, if you look at the whole of the Middle East region, which is quite affluent region in terms of the money which uh, they have, which they can spend on, on food and other products. They rely on about approximately 90% of the food which comes to that region comes from somewhere else. Uh, so it's a huge opportunity. Uh, we had a delegation from, uh, from Qatar just a couple of months ago visited. Um, they, they import 90% of the product for from from outside so the that that region middle east and asia and then then you come to the asia region you've got indonesia sitting just um, next door to us huge consumer market 240 million population china we've got about 100 million muslims so it's 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 a quite a sizable um, market now, in the Asia-Pacific region, we have got about a billion Muslim consumers. Mm -hmm. So, for, for a newcomer dealing with halal markets and, and halal requirements, are these difficult for a non-Muslim to actually understand, to get to grips with? No, there's, the process is quite, quite clear-cut. Um, in New Zealand, we, uh, we have got uh, uh, good setups which can help the newcomers to understand what, is, what are the requirements of the halal markets, and they are pretty straightforward. Um, the concept of halal uh, captures the very essence of, 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 about New Zealand agriculture, the way we do the agriculture, the way we raise the animal, the way we graze them, the, the kind of food which we give to them, the, the care which we take them for, uh, take when we are taking them to, for, for processing and, and so on and so forth. So it's very easy to explain explain the concept of halal and once people understand that they, they, it really strikes very well with their, with their belief system. Um, so halal is both not only just the way you do it, but it's the whole sumness of the product. Well, here in New Zealand, we've had some had a first. Uh, we've had a, a first award. Uh, we've made significant progress, but um, I wonder, has it been roses all the way? It is a, um, it's a sensitive market, but it's a market where now New Zealand, we have got about 30, year, 30 to 35 years of track record. And the, our way of doing it you know, is, is, is very well understood by, by the markets. Initially, there were some problems, but now I think that we are getting along very well. And the organizations which are supporting the certification systems, they are fully in tune and respected. Uh, on top of that, now we have got the halal notice, uh, which is government has taken an interest in this. So it gives an additional um, layer of protection, if you like, uh, and uh, making sure that the um, aspects of halal are properly um, done in a manner they should be. In terms of, of the specific difficulties, we had specific difficulties uh, in dealing with Malaysia relating to slaughter and relating to uh, some contamination of, a, of butter. Is that a particularly sensitive market? And are the markets, in fact, or, you know, we talk about the halal market, but are the markets all the same or are there differences? Um, they are the same, I would say. They are the same. 
Malaysia uh, in recent times has uh, devoted a lot of resources in the uh, research and development of halal um, certification and understanding. And hence, uh, you can say that they are more sensitized in, in a way that they, they look at this issue. We had some issue with them about four, five, six years ago, uh, whereby it wasn't the, um, the way we do the halal, it was the secondary process in the halal for which they were uh, concerned with and they advised us and the industry has taken note of it. They have, uh, they have added in the protocol for, for that market and, and it's, it's now flowing well. And I think out of the 20 plants which were in meat processing plant which were affected by, now 18 of them are fully on board. So. Well, doing all that. well, you have to chair this group, which actually gives us advice on what standards there are. I mean, but is there debate, even within the Federation itself, about what the halal standards are and should be? There is always, yes. I think there are internal discussions and debates. We have got religious scholars who give us advice and we, are, um, we value their advice because they are the people who, who really interpret the laws for us. Um, but the uh, way we do, we are doing currently um, the standing method, which we follow, is is endorsed by our religious scholars, and and so we are okay. The, the there's a more debate more uh, in the area of poultry processing, um, and uh, we we have ongoing discussion do's and don'ts, and. Uh, but as far as the meat processing is concerned of uh, ovine and bovine, uh, that is um, fully ingrained and, and we are quite happy with it. How far off do you think we are from a situation in which there is, quote, a global halal standard? I think that's a very good question which you raised. <laughs> we have been in the... <laughs> How long have we got? <laughs> One minute. <laughs> we, have, uh, we have been uh, really uh, from... Federation of Islamic Associations of New Zealand, which is FIANS, Umbrella Organizations of Muslims in New Zealand, has been quite vigorously campaigning about it. I think there's more awareness. Uh, we, I was in, in, in Saudi Arabia um, in, in January, February, and it gelled quite well with the, with the people there. So we are continuing to, uh, to, uh, uh, to say that, well, we need just one global halal standards. We have got one book and one prophet was it the one way of, of doing things? So well, how, why it has to be different? And uh, I think it's just a matter of time. We will reach there and I'm quite confident that we will uh, get that in two to three years time. Dr. Anne Margani, Chairman of the New Zealand Halal Standards Advisory Council. Coming next, a fresh take on a 40 year campaign to eradicate a disease that still plagues rural life in New Zealand. Leptospirosis, it's a vicious disease, it's probably the biggest disease threat to the health of our livestock and to the farmers and workers who keep the sector running. New Zealand has one of the highest incidences of leptospirosis of all the countries in the world that keep records. And despite a mammoth effort in research, vaccine development and prevention campaigns, over the last 40 years it's still with us. Rural Women New Zealand has been leading the charge since the 1970s, but are they winning? Well, here's Rural Women New Zealand spokesperson on leptospirosis, Fiona Gower. Fiona, thanks for coming in. Thank you very Tell much me, for inviting you, me. Rural Women New Zealand, you've been, the campaign's been on the road now for 40 years. Mm. Why can't we eradicate this disease? Leptospirosis is a really hard one to eradicate because it's in our animals and they just keep picking it up. It's also in our wild animals, like your deer and your pigs, and, and your rats is another one, which is a big issue. And there hasn't been a big vaccination program in our sheep, our beef cattle and our deer up until quite recently. And this is where the, the problem is that these animals are still shedding a lot of the, the leptospires. But if it's in, the, in those wild animals that sort of circle around the fringe of all our farms, mm -hmm. um, it's a fat chance, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> You'll ever knock it out. Yeah, it could be. It's one of those things that I guess the, the researchers are really looking into. That's where they may look at focusing as well. At the moment, the major focus is on our domestic stock, trying to reduce the incidence mm -hmm. of it in our domestic stock before they worry about the other ones. Because the other one that's a major and a one that people haven't realised before is that dogs can dogs. suffer from leptospirosis as well. Your farm dog. Farm dogs. 14% of dogs tested were shown to have leptospire positive titers, so, which is a bit of a concern. 
they actually were obviously exposed to it, not necessarily suffering from it, but certainly uh, exposed to it, and, yes. and perhaps a carrier. Yes, and I have heard of a dog that nearly died from, okay. from leptospirosis. So it, well. is a, it is another concern that <laughs> adds to the pile of changing from the dairy farmers' disease that it was in the 70s and pig farmers through to the meat workers in the 90s, and now it's coming back into the more in the, mm. into the farmers, and there's all these other reasons. It just seems to be changing its okay. way. I mean, but having campaigned it about it for 40 years, how on earth do you keep the message fresh? How do you actually keep people interested in something? 40 years, we still haven't stopped it. You, know, <laughs> no. uh, you sort of get a bit tired, don't you? <laughs> well, we, we did it back in the... Sort of 70s, early 80s, that we did the first push, and that's when we raised $150,000. Mm -hmm. And that's when the rate of leptospirosis went from about 870 in the 7, 1974 down to under 200 in the 80s, which was a great start. It was really when the meat worker died in Hawke's Bay that we thought we need to that, get back that into was weekend. How long ago, about what? Uh, nine, 2007, 2007, the meat worker died. Okay, yes, fine, and yeah. that's when we thought, right, we need to pick this up. and We'd been very comfortable about it. We need to pick it up and run with it again. And new ideas and bringing that awareness to all our farmers, not just the dairy farmers, pig farmers, but to the freezing, the meat workers, the medical professionals, the ones like the shearers and farmers like that, that really need to be aware of how the disease can be uh, picked up. And I, I'm told that uh, leptospirosis occurs more frequently in humans in New Zealand than in any other country where, where records are kept. Yes. I mean, do we know why these other countries have less of a problem than we do? Possibly it's they vaccinate a lot more. They've got a lot more of that going on. Their animals are more intense so they can vaccinate. We tend to look at it and go, oh, do we, can we afford to do it? And that's one of the issues that they have to look at. Also, I guess we're in a lot of contact with some of our animals. I mean, the dairy industry, although they are vaccinated, but there are other places that we can pick it up. And then, as I say, the meat works with all the urine being shed on people in the in the works or uh, anywhere, it's it's a bit of an issue. The, we're also told there's been a major reduction in its incidence in humans yes. uh, since the 1990s. Now, do you know what actually produced that? I think a lot of it is the awareness of what goes in. Uh, uh, down into the, 90, I think, 95, we had well under 100 cases. I think it was um, well under 100. But then again, it spiked again in about 2008. They went up from 66 to 121. And the reason this was, we think, is more of an awareness that people realised more about the disease and people were testing for it and it was actually being diagnosed rather than being considered a flu. And this is, I guess, what New Zealand farmers are a bit like. We think, oh, we've got the flu. We won't worry about it. But it may be a mild case of um, leptospirosis. It can get much worse than that, though, it? Can it can get a lot worse than that. I've had a wonderful letter from a lady the other day thanking Obviously. us for our work. Her father died of leptospirosis in 2000. He was a, he was a fisherman and picked it up from rats. What do you think is missing from the toolbox that could give our farming people total protection? It's a really, really hard one. I mean, the vaccination is probably a huge one. The, the hygiene is important. There's also a lot of other factors that can be considered, like just making sure that you aren't getting splashed with your own. It's like the, the sheep farmers making sure that the sheep aren't there and only off the feed, but off the water before shearing, so that the shearers aren't getting splashed on and the, the shed hands and things like that aren't getting anything on there. It's making sure that that sort of thing is out of the way. It's a very, very hard one, and I guess it's some of the research that has to go on. And some, it's an, an awareness campaign. How do we avoid getting this? Well, you, you, you're on the trail. Uh, tell me, what are the myths, what are the real misconceptions that people have about leptospirosis? What are, what are the things that you most frequently find yourself saying, no, no, sorry, you're wrong? Uh, well, I guess the major one is that, oh, lepto has always been a dairy and a pig farmer's disease. And it's certainly been proved now that it, it has changed over the years from that dairy farmer and the pig disease. It's gone to the meat works, as I said, in, in 2000, it was picked up there. It's now moving back to the farmers. And as I say, lately, the, the rat leptospirosis, the balum, has become the most prevalent one, which is moving that 
proving it's going into like onto the feed in our sheds that the farmers are picking up bags mm -hmm. of feed that the animals have urinated on and that's how they're picking it up. It's just through a cut or something like that. And people are quite unaware of how they can pick it up. You know, you just need a small cut or it goes in through your mouth or your ears. And I think people have got to realise it's not just dairy farmers and pig farmers now, that anyone, um, people tramping that have been somewhere in a rat infested hut, you, you never know. It's a bit scary saying things like that. However, we have to be aware that there are other risks other than the dairy and the, and the pig industry that all, all rural industries can be at risk, including our children. Fiona Gar, spokesperson on leptospirosis for Rural Women New Zealand. And that's all from Sector Report for now. Don't forget, you can check out our programmes anytime online at country99tv.co.nz. Thanks for your company. I'm David Beetson. See you next time.